one. Next round, four corners. Welcome back to the series. And today's guest is Stunt Rock Co Confusion, Christian from Sweden slash French. And he is somewhat something like a, a, a scholar in, in, in music. His knowledge is legendary, as you can see uh, if you watch his, his videos. Today's topic is around the realm of the electronic avant-garde music. And we will see where this topic gets us. Stunty, jump right in. Welcome to the Four Corners. Thank you, fellow Corners. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. And it's a pleasure to talk about electronic music, a topic that is uh, not that often tackled in the VC. And um, one that uh, I guess that with our respective uh, experiences, we we gather that there's a lot of misunderstanding about uh, what uh, what consists, what is electronic music, what electronic music could be more accurately. And of course, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have a, uh, I've been uh, around this music, uh, I've been privileged uh, to be around a lot of musicians, uh, historical figures of that growing up in France, Uh, where music concrete is coming from um, and Sweden being also quite a big um, having a, a huge uh, history with the electronic music studio and all the um, different types of uh, specific local uh, electronic music because that's the thing um, people who are not that much into electronic music tend to think that electronic music is a genre is a style whereas It is music. It suggests that it is electronic, sometimes less electronic than we think, but there's as much a variety of stars in within electronic music than in the whole uh, rest yeah. of electro of music. So how do we gonna start? Yeah. We're all going to show some records, and we all come from. Uh, yeah. We all come from obviously different places, different continents, and in, in many cases, and. And we got introduced to this type of music in different ways. And as we go around sh showing some artists, some records, it's got to change a lot. Because I know I'm coming from the pop or rock commercial side, how I was introduced to it. So um, I guess our, maybe our guest should start showing uh, his first batch. <laughs> um, so maybe the... the um... The first batch won't be the most exciting music necessarily, but like um, this is a record I actually showed on one of Michael's um, videos, a uh, contest. Um, this is Le Solfège de l'Objet Sonore by um, Pierre Schaeffer. Basically, it's, it's a free LP box set with a book, which is kind of the, the idea of um, giving musical value to sounds Uh, from different kind of objects uh, with the, um, the exclusion of any kind of musical instrument. Um, so this is the start of, of uh, tape music, music concrete, um, in the sense that um, uh, th this is from the late 40s. This is music that is allowed, um, that is made possible by the tape recorder and effects and uh, amplification. So. Pierre Schaffer, he was, um, he was not necessarily a musician. He was what you, you would call uh, in French, un homme du 19 e siècle, a, a gentleman of the 19th century, which means that he was good at everything, but not specialized. He was a good writer, a good painter, a good... Uh, he was just interested in everything, but would never necessarily go that deep. But he would start things. He would help kickstart movements, which is what Musique Concrète is. And this is the kind of the founding moment of music concrete. So this is a, 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 this is not very pleasant to listen to because it's basically a list of sounds that he then describes in a very subjective way, but he tries to rationalize it, which is highly romantic in my opinion, which is also some part of, uh, a one of the basis of electronic music in a way. 
So he's sort of like a renaissance man. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, it, and kind of like, a, I guess it's more in the realm of sound design rather than music, straight music. So what happened is that during World War II, or at the tail end of that, at the French uh, national radio, um, L'ORTF, um, there was a, a sound club. People who were just uh, totally mesmerized by this new invention, the tape recorder, a Nazi invention, unfortunately. Um, so they, they took, uh, instead of using it as it was meant, they tried to find a creative, a romantic uh, function for it, recording sounds. And what can we do with sound? We listen to them. So they would gather every week uh, and listen to the sound that each uh, member of the, the circle had recorded and start to to find aesthetic, uh, they, they would attribute aesthetic qualities to different sounds. And then Pierre so uh, essence, had uh, this weird idea of like starting this as a whole movement um, of which the most famous composer would be Pierre Henry. Um, I think I gathered a few of his records here. Um, Pierre Henry, who's, um, he, he, he basically is kind of like, um, um, Friend, the French uh, Terry Riley. This one is called okay. Futuristy. He had um, he had a deal with Philips, a bit like um, Terry Riley had with CBS uh, Columbia. So almost all Pierre Henry records uh, were released by Philips, which meant that he could release whatever he wanted. Also, um, in Sweden okay. we had uh, a guy um, like um, uh, yeah, Ralph Lundstein who also started in the um, early 60s, who also released dozens and dozens of records. Uh, the first ones being very abstract. And over the time, it, he went uh, towards music that was a little more on the new age side of things. And he was kind of a weird uh, <laughs> hippie, almost sexual freak. I visited him one time and he had a few custom synthesizers. Uh, one that was actually um, basically it was like a synthesizer. So basically a little box with four cables, uh, at the end of each cable were, was like a metal clump or something. So you would hold one, yeah. your neighbor would hold one, etc. And every time you touch each, each other, that made a contact that made a sound. And when he demonstrated this to me, he made like a wink, wink. That was great with the ladies. <laughs> It's interesting how most of the um, uh, major labels in the mid '60s to late '60s would would sign at least one or, or two of these sort of electronic experimental artists. They would designate them and, and stick them in the classical section, which is a a smaller, like you said, Terry Riley, and obviously uh, a, a Crumb on, on Columbia as well. Yeah, Terry, right? Terry Riley did all this stuff on Columbia too. Columbia, and that's yes, Okay. Hmm. So, so if, I, if I got you right with the dates, that means that this person, this musician you showed up uh, uh, at the start, probably also influenced Karl Heinz Stockhausen because he, he so has been earlier. I think it's a little bit different. Um, so, Stockhausen um, started out in, uh, I believe, with um, Herbert Heimert and um, Krenke um, in the um, in 51. Um, so it's very interesting. I think it's good to that we talk about it, uh, the ground of it. So this is, I, I believe that this is the first proper electronic music record ever, like meant as electronic music, not just that uses electronic and uh, has no idea what it is. What year is this? Is, this is from 50, 51, yeah. So this is Ernst Krenecke and uh, Gottfried Michael Koenig, um, Klang Figuren, Spiritus Intelligentia et Sanctus. Uh, <laughs> so Things Toratorium for Sting Stimmen und Elektronische Klange. <laughs> and <laughs> the Toratorium for Voices and Electronic Sounds. Yeah, and very close to that comes this the first Stockhausen uh, record, which is uh, also a 10-inch EP. 
also from 51, I believe. Um, and so what they do basically is instead of using tape, they use oscillators. Basically the uh, electronic music in that regard is uh, an oscillator em emitting a sine wave. And right. the oscillator means that you can vary the, um, the sound wave. Very, very, yeah. yeah. That, yeah, exactly. That, that was done in, at the um, Köln uh, Music Academy or something, uh, Music Institute. Um, and what is revolutionary about it and what makes electronic music such a beautiful realm, in my opinion, is that suddenly you escape the concept uh, of 700 years of Western music, which is tonality. Suddenly you're much closer to Indian classical mu uh, music micro tonality because when you got the oscillator when you vary it you are limit there's an unlimited amount of tones you're only limited by how accurate and how <laughs> how you can turn the knob basically on the oscillator that it's just uh, basically uh, liberating the composer from tonality which is in itself totally revolutionary and that, that starts in 51 in germany I'd, I'd like to jump in on a couple of things here because like what happened with the synth movement in the 80s, obviously, a lot of artists, and I'm putting that in quotes, jumped in the bandwagon late 70s and 80s because of synthesizers getting small and handy. And a lot of, or a handful of them were not really musicians. I'm going back and I wanna talk about an inventor who also was a composer, a jazz into swing music. And in 1946, Raymond Scott uh, started Manhattan Research. And he was really, a, he was a composer. He led like CBS Orchestra, uh, did a lot of, uh, one of his most uh, famous uh, tunes ironically is called, I think it's called uh, Powerball or Power, I forgot the name of it, but a lot of young people would get to know it later in the 1990s because his music started getting into a uh, soundtrack like for Ren and Stimby cartoons. And, and that was one of the more famous ones, but he invented, um, he was one of the first inventors of the ring modulator and uh, he influenced Rod, uh, Robert Moog later was uh, influenced by him, but he started all these little inventions made, made making records that were sort of jazz influenced, but with electronic instruments. He had a, a electronic music studio, Inner Space, actually Willow Park, and there's a series of these records that are musical and experimental at the same time. And um, he, he was pretty infamous. He went up and down with success and didn't really, wasn't really succeeding a lot in his lifetime. He did a special project in 19, 61, 62, which is this. And this was sponsored by the uh, Giselle Institute, which Giselle, Giselle or Giselle is uh, Dr. Seuss. And they made a series of records of electronic records, soothing sounds for babies, which are very a moody, ethereal, um, early ambient, or what Eno and, and those kind of artists would do. Of course, they kind of flopped, but they did a whole series based on the age of your baby. Um, these have been reissued in the last few years by uh, Music on Vinyl. They've been reissued a few times, actually. Like every decade, every decade there's a reissue of these, the triple pack that you... Absolutely. And then, in yeah. fact, in the 70s, ironically, um, Motown, Barry Gordy hired him for about nine years, put him on the payroll to invent some electronic instruments for Motown records. And it was one of those things where, after nine years, he worked on the garage uh, for Motown, and it never became anything. Of course, more Motown never went in that direction, but he influenced the, the Moog synthesizer and uh, modulators and uh, what were you talking about? But he, he comes from the music background. So he's one of the few hybrids that was also an inventor as well as a composer and uh, orchestra leader. I believe though that he was uh, the, the first series of three LPs that you showed from him. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this was music mostly made for advertising. So there was a commercial uh, success. He did a lot in, the late, in the late 50s, early 60s, actually, his wife was a singer, one, well, both his wives, and would sing a lot of these jingles, a lot of these radio jingles you'd see on TV and 
you know, land of sky blue waters for beer and all uh, take, leave the uh, drive into us, he would compose music for commercials. So that's how he really made a lot of his money uh, as well as being the band leader for uh, the CBS orchestra after his brother died, who was le uh, leading that orchestra as well. But yet, in fact, there was last year or before there was a great record store day comp on modern harmonia of his jingles. It's like a two record set and it's, it's fabulous. It's not the electronic per se, but a lot of his stuff obviously, and the sounds that he worked on a, a electronic version he invented of the theremin. And we all know the theremin, all those late fifties uh, science fiction movies that sound. And of course the Beach Boys using it too. So Raymond Scott. So we because call this the theremin might be, just so quickly, Michael, because the theremin might be an instrument that many people are, are familiar with the name and the sound, but not necessarily the history. It, it's also a good example of where electronic music can come from because um, Leon Theremin, the inventor of the theremin was a security engineer from Russia who got commissioned a motion detector as a security device for banks in 908, I believe. So basically, if you already saw how a theremin looks like, basically it's two antennas and you put your hand in between and you move and it makes the sound vary. That was a security uh, system. There's a great documentary on it too. So you should seek it out. Going back to the beginning. I, I, we need we needed this uh, displayed on camera from you, Mazzy. Get a theremin next time. <laughs> but coming in in the nineteen forties and early fifties, um, how when, were these were these recordings released um, at, years and years later, or were they released in that time? Like the box set, the three LP first. Was it it's released? A good question. Yeah. The, the the EPs I showed you of. Um, of uh, the German uh, school that were released um, when I told you about. Uh, the box set, uh, I believe, was released in, uh, in uh, 1960 or 59. So um, uh, the French school was more about providing uh, new material for their broadcasting um, companies. Uh, so a lot of this music was uh, very much alive on the, um, on the air. And you have to remember also that the first records um, were made in 50, 49, 50 in the US. Yeah. It arrived a little, just a little later in France. So I believe that the first uh, music concrete records I have, the earliest ones, would be compilations um, mm. on forgotten French labels like Candide. And, um, and these would be in the mid 50s. They would have been issued a little after the fact. There's Bob so Moog. In... Bob Moog uh, with a theremin. Mm. <laughs> huh. So those recordings from that era were in mono, I guess. Yes, but th there's also a great story like that uh, of this uh, unintentional um, electronic music. Philips uh, had uh, this huge, huge, huge uh, factory laboratory between France and Belgium and Holland. And they were basically inventing devices. Sometimes they didn't really understand what they were made for. So they would often just like when someone was developing a machine, they would uh, make a call for the engineer. Is anyone interested in uh, coming and testing these and seeing what, uh, what could be done? And there's two guys, um, Tom Disfeld um, and Dick Heischmaker, uh, more known as uh, Kid Balton, who were two electric engineers who became musicians just because they were working for Philips and were some of the first people to ever test um, oscillators made for making music. And there's one of these early also electronic music records that is kind of emblematic. It's a seven inch of the theme from the Kwai River soundtrack, but made only with synthesizers or early synthesizers. What's, what's the uh, Michael's like show there wears? Texas, Michael. Hi, guys. Um, so I grew up in my household. My father played folk guitar, uh, listened to Santo and Johnny and Richie Valens and Buddy Holly and 
these Everly brothers and Clancy brothers. And that's the world that I, as a child, grew up listening to in my very young age. In 1987, I went to the music shop with my father and this record was playing uh, over the spe over the loud system. No this way. This came out in 1986. You know this? Harold Budd? No, Ray Lynch. Oh, I don't know, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is a guy called Ray Lynch, um, who actually was originally from Texas, but lives in San Rafael, uh, north of San Francisco. This was put out by Music West, and this is the first music I heard that had electronic electronic instruments as the basis of everything. So there is some acoustic flute and some viola and guitar, but everything else is Moog synthesizers, Prophets, Oberheim's, Arp, Juno 60, like all these classic analog synths. So it's completely like computer-based and electronic and analog synth-based music. Um, but it's... It's new age, of course. Uh, in the background, the, it's called Deep Breakfast. Is the, this is his uh, release, and it says, "Evelyn slapped Raymond on the back with a laugh. You must be starved, old friend. Come into my apartments, and we'll suffer through a deep breakfast of pure sunlight." Very bizarre. But I, this was on in the record shop, and my father and I were shopping. This is right when CDs just came out, and my dad bought this on CD. Um, and we played, this is like a very strong record for me in my, I was probably seven or eight years old. Wow. Um, but nice. very, very bizarre music. Very beautiful. It has, <laughs> the instrumentation is kind of classical in the way it's structured, but there's a lot of strange electronic noises throughout. And this kind of painting kind of fits the feeling of it for sure. Mm. But what Stunty, label you know is this one? one? Yeah, I know Ray Lynch. Music West. Yeah, I believe that Ray Lynch was a dance instructor as well. And I think I have a <laughs> private press of his that is actually, um, the music is ghost written by a, a guy who, who at one point was in Tangerine and Dream. So that mm. makes kind of sense uh, that he would do that after. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know the history of, but this, I think originally, this is like 1984, 85. But this was pressed in 86, but kind of interesting um if you're into kind of more like mellow electronic stuff especially 80s new agey not, i mean there's parts where it gets laughably cheesy doesn't hold up today but it's still nostalgic for me and a nice a nice interesting record for sure you can find this i bought this for like three dollars in a charity shop thrift shop cool. myron okay yep. so Stanti said something very, very interesting to me because he, he described how uh, people or, or musicians like, like uh, uh, Stockhausen opens at least the European mind to completely different musical influences from the Far East or, 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 or whatever. And this goes through the decades of electronic music in a way. And, and this may also be the reason why, why, why this guy is considered a very, very influential and, and important electronic musician. His name is Muslim Gauss, and quite a striking story behind him. He, he is your regular English guy, uh, and, and somehow he develops this gorgeous music tapes, is very productive, very fertile put out one audio cassette after after the other and and politically he goes into this yeah palestine palestine problematic and and typical typical cover for for muslim gauze uh, a typical title uzi Ma mahmoud he's always into this political stuff uh, died very very early due to an a uh, uh, mushroom poisoning or something like that and he is one of, of the most influential guys in the electronic avant-garde scene up to now. And, and they are putting out his, his uh, releases next, on, next to a monthly basis. Uh, every one or two months, you have a new Muslim Gauss, which is found. Uh, the main label who is behind him now is this Stahlplatt in Berlin and, and fantastic musician. And he is also very, always uh, um, 
influenced by by the arabic arabic music very much sound snippets from that one really an interesting artist and i'm sure uh, 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 stanti have to add something when it comes to muslim gods muslim you... gods uh, yeah Bryn jones he started uh, his first releases are like from 80 to 83 mm -hmm. when it's uh, really industrial um mm -hmm. Uh, which can mean many different things, but he, he was into tribal noise, um, rhythmic noise, and uh, he, he's, a, uh, he's a guy who was from Manchester. Uh, he died in, uh, I believe it was 1998. I discovered him exactly. probably around 93, 94, and he was releasing, as you were, as you were saying, there was constantly albums coming out from him. Already from Stahlblatt in an um, in uh, Germany, but at the same, or in Europe, at the same time in the US, he, uh, on a label called Soleil Moon. So there was um, there was so many records of him coming out that me and my friends who were always after the new ones. We started to to joke that there was a, this disease, the Muslim gauzit. We have to have everything from him because you know how it is. Last last week, uh, a number eighty seven, I think, number eighty seven came out from Startlat. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he, when he died in 89, there was already almost 200 records of his out. And he has three, diff mo three styles, mostly uh, rhythmic noise, uh, ambient and um, dub. And all of them with uh, Middle East uh, aesthetic then. But since he died, he became, there's a cult around him that has grown. There was already a cult around him because the guy, he lived with his parents till he died also. He's, and his oh, parents wow. had no idea what he was doing. He was doing all the stuff in the garage and producing, like sprouting records after records, just sending the recordings to two or three labels. Then the labels would, will, would package the, the records. And it is true that his aesthetic was so strong and so unusual that he had a huge impact on modern electronic music from I would say from the punk uh, side of things, because it's, he's obviously not a scholar or anything. He was just using the means that were available to him, but he did embrace both the, the Middle East aesthetic and the electronic aesthetic, because there are some great records of his and also some terrible records of his, <laughs> totally uh, unnecessary ones. Yeah. But, but Mezzi, Michael, how, how big is the impact of Muslim gauze in, in the States? Because here in Europe, he's quite a figure. I don't know about him at all. I only know him from his name. I've seen his, anytime I go to any record shop for the last 20 years, if you go to the experimental electronic whatever section, you always see a lot of records from him. Mm -hmm. And I've always, I was always curious what the name meant. Um, and I and I'm also curious. I've heard it a little bit. I've heard maybe only two records from friends mm -hmm. playing it for me, but in the Middle Eastern, the musical inspiration he had in a lot of his music was it from a certain country or was it just kind of a general instrument based? Oh, it, w it was mostly from the Arabic uh, Peninsula. So yeah, but, but like Ar Iraq. Yeah, but I think it's quite important to mention that he wasn't a muslim it's it's not religious at all it was actually i think you're wrong place. i think I'm he wrong? was i think you're okay. wrong he converted to islam but he was okay. um it was not a big thing for him like it's the labels who mm. made it a bigger mm. thing than it actually was apparently okay. that they of course the whole palestinian israel conflict angle is very good for shock value for the covers and the titles so i heard and, and then and then the sudden death <laughs> yeah yeah of course yeah. there's everything yeah. it's a, a made uh, come true for uh, marketing <laughs> it is Sad can you imagine he was doing this all this in his parents garage yeah within six he or got seven into years this... Michael. so wow. he got into this deep thing that took overtook his life completely yeah strange all right yeah. christian you're next um, I think that then um, talking about like introductions to electronic music, not necessarily my my uh, my earliest one, but one album that is quite interesting uh, that has maybe aged a little bit. Um, 
Scorn, Evanescence, the third album from Scorn. Scorn is, um, th this is, came out in 1994. Scorn is the um, project, the band of Mick Harris, the drummer of Napalm Death. So he oh, comes wow. from a fresh grindcore uh, background. But on this, this third album, if you look at the, um, the hype sticker from them, uh, redefining ambient dub. So basically, even he's a, if he's a drummer, the main instrument in this is the mixing desk. Uh, and I went to see him live back then in a small club in, in Paris. And that was the first time I saw anything like that, that on stage, there was a bass player, there was a, a guitar player, but the main attraction was him behind the desk, which is kind of uh, when I discovered more about music concrete, what it is all about. Because if you go to a music concrete gig, um, usually the artist will be in the middle of the audience in the back behind the mixing desk and on the stage there will only be speakers, an acousmonium as they call it, which kind of also is an influence on dub and sound system reggae culture, like they are very proud of their sound system, the, their world of sound, and this um, which uh, had someone that Michael uh, Muller probably knows, um, James Plotkin, uh, who is now a very famous uh, mix uh, sound engineer who does uh, mastering uh, for lots of black metal and post rock mm -hmm. and stuff like that. He, he was playing guitar on this. He was also in a band called Old on the same label, Eric. But this, when it came out, that was uh, for uh, my 16 year old self, that was extraordinary. Um, of course, there's quite uh, uh, strong aesthetics. Uh, I mean, this is obviously early Photoshop, uh, like trying to get this uh, varnish of uh, something uh, old, and a little bit mysterious and a little bit dark. And this is kind of exactly what the music is. It's very slow, uh, roading um, tones, drones with very strong bass lines and uh, very dubby drums. And, um, and that I think that this opened um, uh, electronic music to a lot of people who had a lot of prejudice against it. Suddenly, this guy who's from metal and who's a legend within this genre is making one of the most reverb records in this genre uh, of the 90s. Where, where was he from? <laughs> from Birmingham, which is uh, one of the best cities uh, for uh, avant garde in pop music, in my opinion. Hmm. There's bands like Broadcast, Godflesh, uh, Surgeon hmm. in Techno. Uh, Pram, which is probably one of my favorite prop bands, but um, uh, oh, and also maybe to seek to to uh, Michael, uh, there was a remix album of this, which had a remix by Bill Leswell, one by uh, Meat Beat Manifesto, one by uh, Coil, one by Otaker. Uh, I mean, <laughs> this was really not bad, not bad. incredible. Is, is, is I this, just went on uh, a deep dive with, with Bill Laswell. Sorry, go ahead, Michael. Palominos, you should check out too. Is, is your copy good, ava the availability of this album? Is it? Is it uh, I, I don't is think it so. I, I think there has never been any reissues of this. Um, mm -hmm. There probably will be eventually because um, it's such a cult record and, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. E-Rake, the label, still exists. They probably fucked over uh, Mick Harris at one point or another, so there might be a few difficulties there. Uh, but yeah, th th this is. But you also have to understand that, however, we're um, forward thinking and revolutionary that was back then. It has aged a little bit, like the, the drums, which are kind of breakbeat ish. Uh, we have a lot of more advanced drums in electronic music nowadays. Um, but still, uh, this because it, it is quite dark, I, I would admit. So if, so if you're into uh, that aspect of music, that, that kind of music, then this has still a huge appeal. And I think the sound quality of this is the sound production is very unique. Cool. cool stuff. 
Okay, 1967. Um, <laughs> there's two names that are important that I think a lot of people uh, don't know, and that's Paul Beaver and Bernie Krause. And um, they made three records for Warner Brothers from 1970 to 71, 72. Beaver and Krause. Uh, Warner Brothers Records, when I was growing up, was my favorite label because they would stick with artists whether they sold or not early on, whether it's Little Feet, Bonnie Raitt, Van Morrison, Ry Cooter, Randy Newman, etc. But they did some experimental stuff. Now, in 1967, there was an album that's more infamous than it is quality, and it's called The Non-Such Guide to Electric Music. Non-Such was a, a budget label in a way, but uh, a label, a part of Electra Records. They had a lot of uh, uh, rootsy kind of field recordings of, you know, Panama records, Africa sounds native uh, to the areas. But they did this box set. I think it's a two record box set that um, Bernie Krause worked on, Beaver and Krause worked on. And really it's not, a, I used to have, it. I don't have it anymore. And, but it's a great title the Nonsuch Guide to Electric Music in 1967. But it's really a lot of like noodling. Here's what this uh, modulator sounds like. And I think there's only one actual composed piece of music on it. But Beaver and Krauss were actually the West Coast reps for Robert Moog to sell the Moog synthesizer. And they set up a booth at the Monterey uh, Pop Festival in um, Monterey, California in 1967. And their whole thing, this was the perfect time, right? Of this, this, the summer of love was happening. They sold one of the first Moog synthesizers to Mickey Dolan's of the Monkees. And on the Monkees record, oh, wow. um, I think it's called, was it Capricorn, Pisces? That record, there's on two or three songs, there's some of the first pop uses of the Moog synthesizer. They sold another one to the Birds and that was used, uh, the Birds used it. Obviously, uh, they, Bernie Krause went to London and sold one to George Martin and one to um, George Harris. I mean, George Martin and George Harrison. Their, their records, uh, they're problematic. They're, they're Moog bass, but there's jazz music on it. There's uh, Bernie Maupin, there's uh, Jim Keltner. Uh, the, the later one, this is the, the last of the three from 72. There's even some sort of gospel um, ragtime Scott Joplin pieces on it uh, with uh, some vocals on it. So they're not like great moody recordings. They tried to get a little in the pop rain a little bit, um, but just to, just to kind of piss Michael off in Germany, I have to show this record because this comes out of, of this record. Bernie Krauss went to London to help set up George Harrison's Moog synthesizer after uh, he sold it. Of course, it was used on Abbey Road on several songs, including Here Comes the Sun. Side two of this record, and it was controversial only because while at George Harrison's house in Frere Park, Henley on Thames, there's a demonstration piece that Bernie Krause kind of composed and just noodling and played with on the Moog synthesizer. George records it and puts it outside too on this record without telling Bernie Krause. And of course it's, it's pissed. This was a, uh, a, a label called Zapple Records, which was supposed to be the artsy avant-garde division of Apple Records. And they did John and Yoko records, this record, and it really, it folded fast. It didn't happen. This is an interesting record. It's um, just noodling playing around with a Moog synthesizer. And it's two pieces, one per side. But, um, and in fact, there was some issue right here on some editions, it says Bernie Krause, and then it was whited out his name. So uh, I don't know if there was a lawsuit involved what happened to it, but, but Bernie Krause uh, are kind of the, a big part of the story, at least on the West Coast, West Coast scene of, um, synthesized electronic music. They also did a lot of commercials and soundtracks and Bernie Krause uh, worked on some things at a recording studio in San Francisco called Different Fur that was uh, owned by Pat Gleason, who was a synthesizer player that helped um, teach Herbie Hancock with the sextet to play the Moog synthesizer and set him up. So there's all this kind of, uh, you know, six degrees of separation on the West Coast scene of of uh, 
pop music and jazz that got into the 80s with Headhunters and all that with uh, Herbie Hancock. So uh, I think Bernie uh, Krauss, Beaver and Krauss are underrepresented in the story, even though their records aren't as interesting. But look at that cover, it's a beautiful cover. What did you think of uh, the music back then when it was released? Well, I actually got these then because um, I, I did a video on those Warner Brothers Lost Leader samplers. When I was a kid growing up, the inserts on these records, in fact, here's one right here, you could send away for these two record sets, a dollar a record, for two dollars, you get a Warner Brothers sampler, Frank Zappa, mm -hmm. Randy Newman, Ry Cooter, Black Sabbath, Bernie and Krauss. I first heard it and it just, it, it, it was interesting to me. When I've done these videos on talk, how I got into Indian music because of George Harrison and Ravi Shankar, these pop artists led me to that. Is electronic music, a lot of people say it's unlistenable. And it's, I appreciate it more now that, you know, 50 years later than mm -hmm. I did then. These, I think the problem with these records is there's no single mood to them. There might be a, there's one record that has like a funky kind of soulful song and then just easy going mellow, uh, synthesizer based ambient music. So it's, they're almost trying to do too much to make it accessible. Uh, Bernie Krause later would go on to do, I don't know, there used to be a, a, a chain of stores in America called the Nature Company. And Bernie Krause was one of the, um, sold a ton of CDs to the Nature Company where he started doing these rainforest electronic music ambient records that were extremely popular. Uh, Paul Beaver died at a young age, unfortunately, but, um, Bernie Krauss is, I mean, is, is to me an important part of this story. Have you ever owned a rain stick? <laughs> My photographer, Michelle Clement, for five years photographed all the products for the nature company. So that was a great store, right? An they ha and they had a, a, a kiosk with all the CDs and you could push a button and listen on headphones. It was Well, incredible. and then it begat, like remember Hear Music? It was another, the chain of Hear Music that had those little things. So I know it's kind of an, another story, but um, I think yeah. for the West Coast, that's an important uh, part of the story too. And that kind of new agey thing that you were talking about, Michael, about records, how the synthesizer became a part of, whether it's, you know, Wyndham Hill or, or these new agey kind of things uh, that, that caught on about that, so. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's my next pick. So you think you think that that this kind of records got Herbie Hancock into his latest? Well, stuff? I I know for a fact. Uh, I mm -hmm. I wasn't going to show, but this is Patrick Gleason. He did this record, a synthesizer of the Four Seasons. He owned different fur recording studios in San Francisco. That almost all those first uh, Wyndham Hill records were recorded in the Mission District, and um, he owned that studio. And he was at the time married to Joan Jean Renault who was a cellist in the Kronos Quartet. That's how I got to know them. And they lived upstairs mm -hmm. in this beautiful like loft above the studio. Um, he was brought in, he plays on that, um, I forgot the, not the Headhunters before that, the real wild uh, Herbie Hancock uh, synthesized Rick. I don't have it here, that he uh, plays on. And he's the one that's, that taught and set up Herbie uh, with the synthesizer. Cause Herbie, you know, obviously he was doing, he did, acoustic piano, the electric piano, but uh, Herbie got dived really into the synthesizer. And also Pat Gleason worked on the soundtrack to Apocalypse Now. All those helicopter sounds weren't real helicopters. It was all synthesizer based. That's a great soundtrack too, even mixed with the doors on that. But um, so he's an influence of, 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 uh, technically, not really musically to influence Herbie, but um, it leads. And, and Paul Beaver worked on these Apocalypse Now, uh, recorded his records at different first. So that's incestuous kind of group mm. of artists and electronic artists, uh, you know, that weren't as much avant-garde. They were recording classical pieces that we all know from my generation switched on Bach with, with uh, Walter Carlos, you know, so. Interesting. This is, a good, this is a good lesson today, learning so much. <laughs> it's it's uh, funny though the, because like what you're saying uh, uh Mazzy, th there's lots of records like that like you named herbie hancock uh, but on a much milder level uh, because it's just keyboards that george duke is playing on this but still this 
makes the record. That's what makes the record stand apart, the, the aesthetic, the electronic aesthetic that is very subtle in it, but not just on the level of the aesthetic. Also, the, what kind of music can you do when you start using electronic uh, uh, instruments and records like this that like Michael must know very well, which this one is a very, this is a milestone of electronic music. What is that? E2, E4 by Manuel Gutschin. Oh yeah, um, incredible. This is um, this has been sampled by house music uh, and pop countless times. So the, there's this uh, one of the most famous um, New York New York house uh, uh, tune uh, called Sueno Latino is basically a ripoff of this with just some extra uh, uh, hi hats and and uh, and drums, but. Um, this record um, also, also defines everything that, that uh, a lot of Detroit techno, like Jeff Mills, this very motoric and repetitive, trancey, but minimalistic, sparse music. Um, the 70, you know, the 70s, the jazz artists like Weather Report, Joe Zawinul, all, all those people got into the, uh, the fusion thing, really got electronic music. Of course, Prague, which I'm not going to talk about, but you know, there's a Keith Emerson and all these artists using that as well too. So, all right, Michael was Gutching. He was a guitarist mainly, right? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. And there's the artist, American artist Mark McGuire, which is like kind of a total ripoff of his some of his guitar guitar based work. Still beautiful. Yeah. Am I? I hope we got through an hour of this without. And I said the Beatles before Michael said Kraftwerk in terms of electronic oh. music. How did that happen? <laughs> because good. we are stunned about the knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> but and I don't want to be so profane and mention Kraftwerk when, when he's talking about yeah, this yeah. kind of stuff. No, now that Stronger has been mentioned, um, it's... It's something that we very seldom think about, but like at first, there's so many connections. Like um, yeah. this, soft this is a white soft label, machine. so that that's why I don't have the artwork. But soft machine in their this is from '79. Uh, there's one whole side of it that is pulsating, more odor esque uh, uh, stuff, and then two of the guys from um, from soft machine did this album in um, in 1980. No, 78, yeah. This is pure disco, boogie, electro. It sounds exactly like Justice sounds 30 years later wow. or uh, <laughs> 35 years later. Like this, you know, this, um, these bass lines may, made on the keyboard uh, and extreme sharp contrast between the keyboards and the arrangement with the chords and all that. This, this, is, a, this is the kind of covers you would expect to find in the dollar bean also. And there's no mention of this being a soft machine. Uh, and I think it was only released in France and Italy, but, but so there are connections like that. And even later, when you think about um, when electronic music in the, in the most popular uh, way became popular in um, first, I guess, in, um, in, uh, in the UK with stuff like that, KLF, Shield Out, uh, and then with, sorry, um, with the Orb, uh, the first album called uh, Adventures Beyond the Ultra World, uh, Patterns and Textures from, yeah, it's basically it's almost like a, a, a um, how would you say, uh, um, a prog rock uh, album name. And actually, they, they used to work with uh, Steve Hillage from Gong. And when this single was released by The Orb in 91, The Blue Room, a 40 minute long song that uh, uh, topped the charts in the UK, uh, the mainstream charts, number uh, at place number eight, a 40 minute long song. So the critics were like, we never expected that prog would have such an inf uh, influence on pop culture. So they even had to change the, uh, the, the rules of what could be a single in the UK because no one expected that a 40 long song could, could top the charts. Uh, and, and so there, it's true that like, it's easy now to forget that aesthetically 
a lot of this music actually has similar aspiration as prog. And when you think about prog, what it means, progressive, progression, like ex escaping tonality and liberating yourself from the constraint of the regular instruments, that is as prog as it gets. Yeah. In a way, yes. Really right, terrible. Michael. Okay. In 1995, I'm going to talk about a group I talk about a lot. So sorry if you follow me and you're sick of hearing me talk about the Chicago group called Tortoise. But their first record in 1994, it was, came out in 94, I heard it in 95, blow, blew open my mind in terms of what could be done when you connect and overlap the melange of electronic and acoustic instrumentation. I didn't see them play until early 1998 when this record came out. It's called TNT. It was on the Chicago label called Thrill Jockey. And when I saw them play, I wasn't, I didn't realize there were so many instruments. It takes up the whole stage. They had Moog synthesizers, some programming, some MIDI, marimba, vibraphone, two drum sets, two, two electric bass and electric guitar. Uh, this album starts off almost like a avant jazz experimental. And then by the end of it, it's pure electronic. Um, samples and all sorts of crazy stuff but this also has woodwinds has bassoon and trombone and cornet um, when i saw this performed live i was 17 years old and uh the opening act for the tour was oval o-v-a-l if you are familiar with him uh and from this record they had a lot of remixes that they commissioned uh oval. is it oval the first yeah, uh, so i had incredible incredible music i never really heard music like that and they had luke vibert and Derek carter and it's the first time i ever heard autecker doing remixes of this stuff and those are all 12 inch singles and it is the perfect strange marriage of this kind of jazz based acoustic instrumentation with this modern moog and then also world music mixing in marimba and it is incredible incredible strange nothing else sounds like this they just had the uh, 20 year reunion of this album um, in Chicago at the museum, the art, the Museum of Modern Art there, Chicago Museum of Art, what's it called? And they played this whole record um, in its entirety, and I, I, I went just to see it. So they, this is probably Wait, one probably. of the most influential albums of my life. Looks like a um, Daniel Johnson cover uh, illustration. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I don't know who drew that. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's not him, but. I remember when but, it came out, I was so pissed off by the cover. Like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I like that. Yeah, it doesn't really fit the music. But when, when you listen to this record, it, it starts off and you get kind of lost. And it seamlessly totally flows from these kind of ornate jazz experimental rock compositions into pure straight. There's one song that has a sample that just says over and over, ah, oh, fuck, ah, oh, fuck, ah, oh, fuck. And you don't even really notice that you're listening. It's mesmerizing music. But uh, this is one group that um, I've been lucky to see a handful of times. And every single time, it just totally blows me away with the way they compose and use these instruments. Totally unique sounding music. Could it be that like the oh, fuck, oh, fuck uh, sample could be an homage to the butthole surfers, uh, cunts, 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 on their uh, Locust uh, album. It really could be. I, I never really thought about that. I think maybe you're right. It must be, right? <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, Mr. Germany. Okay, so you mentioned the group, Michael, and and for me, this is one of the most important group of the last decade or, or two decades. And this is Orteca. And yeah. this, this Orteca, they, they, the sheer magnitude of, of, of their releases musically and, and, and as a physical object is, is, is stunning. They have so great sounding additions. And, and what I, I'm showing here is one of four parts. All parts are three disc 
vinyl sets. And this is one release, the NTS sessions. And, and the sheer magnitude to go through those, the, the, the impact, the power of, of, of this music is sometimes really overwhelming. It's not an easy listening, but... but Say it again, Michael. It is a 12 LP album. <laughs> How one, pro -rock is three, that? <laughs> part two, three disc. Yeah, I've got it two. as a box set, the whole thing. Yeah. And part four. This is one release. <laughs> yeah. But but it's typical for this for this kind of stuff. And and now if you think it it, it gets mm, somewhat uh, exchangeable. No, it doesn't. It's had, it has such an intensity and, 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 and magnitude. After two hours, you want more and more and more, and, and they give you more and more and more. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable stuff. Completely different of, of, of uh, uh, the most uh, uh, listening experience you usually get when you uh, uh, listen to the music we in the GC talk about, this is overwhelming, gorgeous stuff. And this Orteca, I think they are one of the most important bands ever. I, think. I agree. If, if you, yeah. And for me, quickly, uh, for me, Orteca is my is the most important band of my youth. And up until 2005, I thought it, between 93 and uh, 2005, it was the most relevant uh, band in any kind of uh, genre. And it, it's very interesting to talk about them uh, in many regards. This is their first record ever. It's uh, an EP that came out in 1991. It's a hardcore, UK hardcore. So it's like proto jungle. Uh, so there's lots of sample of like dentist uh, drilling. There's even a sample, like I've never seen anyone mention this because probably the people who are into that don't know, but there's, or, there's a sample of Hawkwind in this. Uh, it's very short, but, what? but then what's interesting is that up, up, this is from 2003. It's called Gansgraf. And I think this is, their highest point after that uh, uh, pointed to the light maybe okay no. yeah sorry my lightning uh, i know we talked about this <laughs> my lightning is the best but what's, what's really interesting about this um there, there are many things but there's one thing that we haven't talked about yet uh, regarding electronic music this music in a very romantic and literary way is about the future it is about being futuristic. When you listen to this, you get this feeling of being uh, projected in, in a future that is difficult to grasp. This is too much uh, uh, often when you first hear it. It, it takes a while to accust accustomate you, yourself to it. And I remember up until this record of Otteker, almost every time they had a new release, it, it was like always like two steps uh, before me like it took a while to to find a way to enjoy it sometimes mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it was direct but up until this record it was always this is the future and that's a one of the the most singular qualities of that music there, there's not that many kinds of music that literally um, have the ambition of addressing the concept of uh, future and futurism in a kind of science fiction romantic way. You know, I always say that uh, Ortega's music is like uh, putting quantum physics into sound. <laughs> it's, it's, I agree, it's, it's completely futuristic. Michael in Texas, what do you think about Ortega? Um, I, don't, I don't know a lot of the, earth, the, the big box that you mentioned. I don't, I've never listened to mm -hmm. that. I only know really the one that has the kind of pink desert sands on the front. Amber. Mm -hmm. Amber, yeah. That's the only one I really spent a lot of time with. But I remember I got, when I first, in the late 90s, I listened to Autechre and Aphex Twin a lot and like trying to get into that world a little more. And there's a mm -hmm. lot, I mean, I, I'm always wanting to hear melody and there's always not melody. So sometimes it's not the best, but there are very nice moments of serenity and clarity 
kind of mixed in. Um, but I, it's really nice, especially in, in nice headphones to listen to that stuff. It's just the mixing is superb. There's one thing that you have to understand also about Lothaker that it, it mostly is a music that is about rhythm about percussions and and stru uh, structures basically if we go back to the technical aspect of music um, of electronic music most of the music in the past 20 years now has been made through max msp which basically is a program that lets you build your own vir virtual instruments so you're only limited by your imagination in, in a in a certain way and that's what they are all about. At the core of it also, most of their rhythms, you could draw a, um, um, a parallel with hip hop because most of it is 90 BPM uh, beats per minute. And they just deconstruct the whole um, hip hop trope, uh, traditional trope, and make it something that is at times antagonistic and at times seducing and at times both at the same time. Mm -hmm. Michael, the box set you showed, it's for the NTS sessions, right? And this is a UK <laughs> I did radio. I so, yeah, those are the NTS, NTS sessions, right. Mm -hmm. right? Right. And if anyone's unfamiliar, the NTS uh, radio program, they also have a really nice series still going on today of having artists come in and do uh, mixtapes, playlist, and DJ, which you can stream and you can learn about a lot of great music that way. That's I listen to those quite a lot. We'll yeah, and, 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 and I, I have sometimes the opinion, probably not not a bit, a bit stupid what I say, no, but it's my own personal feeling. I think this kind of music nowadays is is more connected to people like the late John Coltrane than anything. If you are looking for the new John Coltrane or a new Sonny Rollins. You may find him in this area of music nowadays. Wow. It's, it's quite a good uh, point. Uh, um, so often I think, believe that Ottaker are at their best when they are remixing someone else. Because whenever mm. they do a remix, or 99% of the time, it turns out to become uh, to be a, an Ottaker track in the end. And uh, I remember um, there's one remix they did of this band called Lexus, uh, no, Clute. Uh, which is a drum and bass band and basically it sounds like a, a drum solo of free jazz uh, but the most exciting you've ever heard and when you vary the speed which actually they they are very playful with that how they release sometimes uh, records that are not at the right speed or at the speed that it was composed you have to figure it out your, by yourself um, it's minor in their career but it has happened uh, but yeah there is the level of complexity and inventivity in the rhythm is uh, you would get the same feeling as when you hear Tony Williams for the first time uh, and stuff like that. Wow. If there was one Autecker record you could recommend to someone coming into it new, which would you guys recommend? The one you told about the, the uh, uh, Ember. 2003? Uh, Release. Uh, you know what? It's funny because Ember is probably the mo one of the most uh, um, talked about because it's the most uh, it's the one that has got kind of ambient pieces that is more it's the more easy to access. But it was conceived um, as a follow up to their first album, uh, pressured by the label who asked them, "Please, we want you to do this the same thing again." So this is an album that they kind of hate themselves in a way because they were forced again, to do again. It. Again, with John Coltrane stunted, this is their ballads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but it's true, yeah. 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 But it's the, the least Otecker one in some way, even if the, the whole harmonic system yeah, they have. But, but still, Stanti, it opens yeah. the door. In a way, yeah. it opens the door. Mm. And then maybe Exile, the, the, the three-disc mm. album, and, and also gorgeous one and easier to get in. And then other stuff. Maybe there's one thing we, we need to point out then is that in elect in this kind of electronic music, uh, EPs, albums, is kind of a very fluid concept. Like uh, most of their EPs, which are four songs, are double uh, e uh, 12 inches uh, in the 90s. And they are as worth, if not more, uh, than the albums. I think that the, the more compact a release you get from Otteker, 
this is where you'll get the be the biggest essence of them in a way. And we really, really are curious to hear Messi's take on Otteker when he will. Uh, I have no I idea what the fuck you guys are talking about half the time here. <laughs> I, I, obviously you you've watched some of my videos. I bring it back. My main thing is harmony, melody. I'm a big melody fan. So any of this music, a lot of times I bring it back to the pop realm. I don't mean like current pop in 2020s or even the 90s or the 2000s. Um, during the 80s and early 90s, I would go to see a lot of these sort of performance pieces, avant-garde pieces. In the early 80s, I, I went to see Throbbing Gristle. And, and to me, that kind of stuff was, it interests me it was so out there. And even though I bought those records, I hardly ever listened to them, but I love seeing them live. Yeah, I'm not showing any Throbbing Gristle. That's a later, it's a comp, right? Yeah. Um, but it's called but the I'm gonna beginning go with, I'm gonna go with the music very, of very commercial because I'm going to an album that's 21, year, 21 years old now. That was, you know, a Brit pop band that made what, two or three records. And then they did this, Kid A. and Everything, everything in his right place. When I put this CD on, when I first got it, I was blown away. To me, it was one of the most beautiful things I had heard at that time. I had a CD of that in my office. I literally had the song repeat about 10 times. You know, you can repeat that one track. This is for, for a lot of, you know, obviously Radiohead fans who had been with them since Creep and, and even OK uh, Computer, this, I think alienated a lot of their audience. And I know Tom York really didn't want to do another Brit pop or another rock and roll record guitar bass that all these bands were doing. And I think this was a, a, a challenge for them. It was originally recorded uh, enough, it's going to be a double album. Uh, and of course it was split. And then after this amnesiac was the second part of it. I think the first part is more successful, although you could interchange it. I love, um, the national anthem, the song on here, but and but but to me, to me this is a perfect record. But I know how it turned people off, and it led them on a path that a segment of their audience and people get tired of. Um, moon shaped. I I go with I, what I like about them too is their visualization with the artists they work with and their packaging is as important uh, as the music and the you know the box sets with all these great artists. Oh, this actually, this is In Rainbows, I'm sorry. Um, beautiful cover, beautiful artwork. I'm not gonna get into all that, but Moon Shaped World, uh, gorgeous artists where they worked on these great large canvases with these painters and visual artists. And of course, you know, they got into a whole other thing. The way I think when they put out Radio, I think it was Kid A was the record or the one after that, they, they decided they're gonna, Anybody who wants it could have it for free originally, streaming or pay. And it turned out people paid for it. Kid A was a number one record for weeks in the UK. It was number three in the United States. So they found their commercialism um, in a way with this these great, you know, beautiful uh, physical art and an ambient art. And of course, Tom's vocals aren't for everyone, but they're not, it's very, very accessible. And his solo records and his collaboration with Adams for Peace with Flea, the bass player from um, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, I think is a, is a great, great record. That's one of those records, I think Michael and I uh, had this experience once. I can't remember now if that's a 45 or 33, but for the first month I played it at the wrong speed. Um, Anemic. <laughs> and I didn't even, yeah, I didn't, that's right. And I didn't even notice the difference <laughs> and it didn't matter. <laughs> exactly. It's so beautiful to me. So. I tend to get into this music uh, as much as I like ambient. I don't play a lot of that unless I'm working and I might put it on a, a CD or something, but I like the song based a little structure to my ambient music on a regular basis. And I, th I think that's a good uh, way for people who are not, can't get exposed to the avant-garde uh, from through pop artists like mm -hmm. that. And I was going to show, but I'm not going to show uh, Bjork. Bjork's another one like that, who really just as an artist, as an auteur, her visual styles. And again, I won't show them except for, you know, showing all, all these records to me that are beautiful pop, rhythmic dance, electronic records 
that mix them. And, and she comes from the post-punk because I used to, I saw the sugar cubes when they first came around and that's how I first got introduced to her. But I love that she's really gone yeah. into the visualization and the art side of it and museum. And the, but, uh, go ahead. I think, that's, I think we I did, think a, 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 maybe Michael is thinking the same thing as I am. I think we did a, a slight mischaracterization of Otaker in the sense that it is way less unmelodic as you seem to have gotten from uh, from us it's just that they got a very unique and personal harmonic system that you can find in most of their releases and the way the melody is kind of hidden makes it when it comes finally comes out the, one of the highlights of the music it's not like it's, electron, just, it's not like electronic drone then it's not no 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 okay. no it, it is uh, the way they will like sculpt a melody um got it is very unique mm -hmm. but it's quite skeletical but like when you finally usually uh, a, a typical otaker song will start with drums and then there will be some drones and harmonies pads and then a skeletical kind of melody that either you like or you don't there are some i think are beautiful and some that annoy me so it's a bit just like any kind of band and but you have to also uh, think that this is one of the D2 bands that really made the label work with Aphex Twin that Michael was talking about. But the one that actually really started it all for Warp, they just had a smaller career, is the band that Tom York actually names as the main influence for Kid A, which is this oh. LFO. Uh, which is this is the original this is the reissue from a few years ago as a double lp with all the tracks there's two tracks missing on the original as uh, you guys uh, who are more into for, for the people who are more into the concept of albums and all that this is almost as close as it gets uh, as, a, as far as i'm concerned as a perfect album there is like 14 songs on this there's not a single one that isn't good Okay. Every single one is feels from uh, being from the same artist, but also is different from each other. Uh, almost everything has hooks, uh, very catchy ones. Uh, and, and it is um, also the kind of house techno albums that no one does anymore, because nowadays it will have like two or three kinds of, new, of styles of constructions. And that's it. You'll have like a techno track like a, a more like down tempo track and maybe one ambient track this is the real this is an album I'm, for the I'm amazed on how how all in the last few years maybe it's been longer and i'm just been more aware of it that these bands that to me started out uh in the indie realm as um uh, folk americana really merge into the electronic or, or psychedelic also even groups in the uk like temples they started doing more dance based Mm -hmm. uh, bon Iver from obviously his Wisconsin kind of folky, lo-fi folk, freak folk, whatever you want to call it. Now it's synthesizers and, and all these different uh, mix remixers on them. These artists have really gotten into that kind of stuff. And the fans, it's kind of, I kind of, the cliche, which I, I sound like an old fart, you're talking about the Coachella crowd. Every band is synthesized, dance-based pop in a way, and not to put it down at all, but it, they've merged into that, where I get into the folk scene or the other scene, but it's it's so much electronic mused, music fusing into all this other stuff now. I mean, I'll take were twice headlining the Coachella Festival in the 90s. Is Balmoray's dance record coming out soon? I don't even know, you know? <laughs> well, I, I mean, think it goes back to what, what Stunty was saying. It's like you when you, when you take away a, an acoustic instrument, you remove the limit to the sound, to the sonic, to the frequencies and to the, you know, to the depth of hearing. Like, so you have this whole new palette and all these new colors. So I think that an artist like Bon Iver, you know, yes, he could continue to make the same folk album over and over again, but it's so much more interesting as, as an artist to, to expand the color, color palette. I don't even mean it as a criticism, but I, I totally get that. Oh, no, no. You know, yeah, the yeah. joke with me is what I like about the Beatles at every record, they did something different. They didn't try to repeat themselves each time. And I love that when an artist does that. I don't need, you know, Fleetwood Mac to do rumors every year, you know, or something, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but I think that uh, you Mazzy, put out a, was, was a great thing that you did that because 
that also shows very positive mechanisms you know with kit a they they took out a lot of of this electronic avant-garde they they took out the merits the good things and and brought it to a to a wider audience and and this also means that some people get into this kind of avant-garde st uh, stuff more due to the release of kit a so this is a very positive thing i think when when artists like portishead or Björk are so successful and become huge and and, and took this took this kind of stuff out of the uh, avant-garde uh, scene and again lfo was actually the secret weapon of Björk as he produced uh, the first four or five albums of hers with graham massey but uh, oh, yeah. and he also produced some depeche wow. mode there you go yeah incredible okay. Does, does it stand for low frequency oscillator? Exactly. The acronym LFO. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow, I didn't realize that about the Bjork production. Amazing. Yeah, like um. Uh, Mas the... No, go, go on. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, no. I'm just curious if Ma um. I, I will say that Kid A is my favorite Radiohead, and I really love the the Eraser, the Tom York solo record. But I was curious if you've heard the newest Tom York collaboration with Fortet and Burial Mazzy. The br a brand new one. Nice. Maybe it came out three or three months ago, four months ago. I have the the solo album he did where he made that ten minute video. Um, I forgot who he no, was. This is with. like in, in during the pandemic. This came out. No, I haven't heard it. I think it's just two songs. I'll send it to you. It's quite nice. Okay. Your turn, I guess. Who? I my turn? me? I think it's your turn. Yeah, turn. I, I, I'm I lost. lost. I did Radiohead. <laughs> Come on, Michael, go. Okay. Um, so I recently did a video on my channel, um, a new series where I'm kind of highlighting a, one specific artist and talking about their history and their music. The first one I did was on uh, the musician Grouper, and uh, I love her music, and uh, I kind of love her taste, and anything she mentions I will check out because I just appreciate her ear and her aesthetic. And in one early interview I was reading of Grouper, they asked what her favorite record of all time was. And she said this, oh. which is interesting because this Wolfgang is a, Voigt. a German guy named yeah, Wolfgang Voigt. And this is called Gas, G-A-S. There, there it is. Uh, and this, this is his album called Pop. This is on the German label uh, called Compact. And this is pure like hypnotic, like repetitive hypnotic these little like a small little loop and a sample over and over and over again but it's very organic and very human sounding um i have no clue how this music is made or what what he's using to make this music all the records are very similar aesthetically with like a zoomed in shot of a tree or a forest with just the name gas in the front and they, I think they and all one have color. single. There's also it's, yeah. it's the theme is that they every color every cover has one major color. Yeah, yeah. I checked this out, it, uh, not knowing what it was. Yeah, it takes. It's not for everyone. It takes a little bit of time. You have to sit with it, and it's one that you really. Ah, Michael, Mezzi will love him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mezzi, you Mezzi too. Will get him. I've already. Uh... <laughs> really. I, I have to promise you your box I on probably. the because of you too. Jesus <laughs> Christ. You will love it because also there's a literary connection. Uh, the previous album from Gas is called Zauberberg. Uh, there's this Thomas Mann connection. Wow. And the way the music is being done actually is in a way similar to the caretaker that you, you love so much. He basically uses um, romantic classical music uh, loops that he slows down so much and and use the the you know the um, the revolution of the loop as the the pulse because there is a pulse in that music it is mm -hmm. post club music in a way there, mm -hmm. there will be a, a rhythm uh, structure that is repetitive but very much in the um, not in the forefront where is he right. from where is he from from germany germany Oh, I would think in Germany they would uh, they would I thought in Germany they'd call it petrol. <laughs> petrol, that's good. Funny for the autobahn, yeah. Well, we gotta have a little humor. Uh, anyways, this, this music is too fucking this, serious. 
sample oh. this digitally and put it on late at night and kind of read a book or kind of get lost. I mean, it is right. lay on the I'll ground. On and I will say this video. <laughs> yeah. They, no, they just, the the way, I would uh, suggest than Mecca 3. <laughs> <laughs> they, they just uh, reissued a record of his that origin came out as an EP called October, which is my, in my opinion, his absolute best and now it's an extended version of it so it's an lp mm, great to, as know. we're into um we're seeking into craftwork jokes so because mazzy had his beatles so here is something i don't know if michael knows this but there's no. something also that we we didn't mention um is how uh, electronic music is important for um the afro-american community also because of house, techno, electro. This is the Electroids, which is basically Drexia, um, uh, Afrofuturistic uh, Detroit techno electro band. Uh, that, and this album that came out on Warp in 1995 uh, is obviously a pastiche of Kraftwerk. And it's a perfect album also. There's um, something like, yeah, there's 11 songs, Every one of these is great. Uh, and it is Detroit techno and craft work at the same time. Mm -hmm. And this was for years like a, a, a holy grail for many people. But it, I think it's got, it got reissued a couple of years ago. So now it's readily available with some bonus tracks as well. But this is, this is a really um, kind of um, <laughs> Uh, uh, at the crossroads of many things that we've been talking about. <laughs> Amazing. It's interesting that, that the color of that album cover is similar to the, the Kraftwerk. What's the album called? Computer Love? I don't know the out title. Similar color. Michael? Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I was just uh, uh, this. Uh, so, so, excuse me. Michael, the other Michael was saying that this, this is also visually of course, uh, a reference to Kraftwerk, to a certain album of them. Hmm. I don't sure, know. it is. It even, even, you know, the, there are four guys, also yeah. two Beatles. Obviously. It's like the Beatles, God. <laughs> <laughs> you guys. <laughs> Electroids, the fab, the other fab four, yeah. All right, Michael, Germany, let's see what he got. Okay, I got, I, I get into a different realm we, we haven't talked about so much. Um, ambient but a special branch in, in inside the ambient uh, uh, area dark ambient my favorite at least uh, up to now my favorite branch of the ambient scene and this is delicate cut oh amazing and you know that michael tahoe yeah yeah of course no. for me and uh, um, um stanti said that term several times now this is a perfect album Beautiful cover. Gorgeous listening, dedicated cut. Yeah, uh, he only has two albums out. I think two or three, not much. It's 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 from from when is this album? I don't find it. Yeah, I'm sorry, but fantastic album on the cranky label. A little hard to get now. Thank let's you. hope that there will be a reissue very soon. But this dark ambient uh, stuff. Explain that. Explain what dark ambient is. Watch, like, watch an uh, avant-garde horror movie. Like goth metal? No. No, 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 no not at all. Very droney, mellow, um, kind of like slow. minor keyed. It's not. It's like pretty somber. I would argue that there is no such thing as non-dark ambient. Uh, ambient. If it is ambient, it is dark because ambient, real ambient, has tension. Whereas when you yeah, but, get... but I don't consider Brian Eno dark. Yeah, I was going to say Brian Eno steps very uh, light music for airplanes, yeah. all that kind of you know. Yeah. And one thing which, is, which makes it kind of almost new age, <laughs> but well, that you could yeah. uh, you could argue yeah. that, but it's bad branding for a lot of people who, who get turned off by that uh, genre. For example, the caretaker uh, is also sometimes considered as dark ambient. Hmm. Yes, aspects of dark ambient, but this is pure, in my opinion, pure dark ambient, very uh, hypnotic. You always, you know, there's always a demon who, who will come around the next corner when you yeah. listen to the music. 
you always feel there is something dark out there and 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 it it, it will come but you never know when it comes to but it's Darkness not, Michael, I, I would say that it's not dark in uh, like an adolescent, like uh, Marilyn Manson way, because no, no, there no, is no, no, darkness, no, no, no. but there's also uh, the, the balance to it. There is also serenity, um, mm -hmm. because you can compare it like as a band that Michael must love, um, Stars of the Lid, uh, all their early stuff. It's Now it's more on the new modern classical side of things, but earlier you'd have like these drones and these paths that are very serene and suddenly something shifts and it gets somber mm -hmm. and more, way more tension. But mm -hmm. that's this contrast that makes this music really interesting. Great. And exactly. the Dedekin cut, well is, Dedekin cut is great, like Mazzy, it's not dark, like there's nothing like abrasive, it's very, easy to hear and listen to but it's not it's not like uplifting happy music. that's okay no I'm... one thing great uh dedic dedicant cut is the guy's name and it's very important actually because there are not a lot of black people making this type of music and he is one okay. right so we... well worth a check out should we do one more full round maybe or as you like we can go on. Yeah, who's Let's do at least one more. I can go on. You guys decide. I, I think. I think Stanti Stanti, is Go ahead. No. Uh, uh, there's one other thing. Like we kind of talk, touched this a little bit, but uh, on one of Michael's recent videos about like electronic uh, records, um, uh, it like uh, it really highlighted um, one of the misunderstandings about electronic music. Also, mm -hmm. which is we we started. We talked about how electronic music can be tape music, which means that like collage, sound collage, etc., and ambient can feel recordings uh, or oscillators, so pure tone. And when people think that electronic music uh, sound should, is better suited for the CD, that probably means that in their head, in their mind, they associate electronic music with digital sound, which we obviously proved is not the case uh necessarily and historically that being said there are artists that totally embrace the um digital aesthetic of sound one such is uh, uh, snd snd mm -hmm. is a british band from manchester uh i, I know that there's not much to see on this cover but um <laughs> there are contemporaries of otaker and as much as otaker also have uh, embraces uh, the digital aesthetic uh, at times, it is not the core of what I do. SND is the core of what I do. A little bit like early Oval that um, uh, Michael was mentioning. Uh, the first Oval record is basically uh, made out of samplings of CD skippings. So it's using the harmonies that you get uh, when a CD skips and uh, they arrange it into a linear um, musical uh, construction that kind of almost sounds like Hawaiian ambient in a way. Uh, and this comes from uh, embracing the digital aesthetic, but the accident, the glitch. SND is really much more on the hard science level in a way, um, really trying to seek out frequencies that cannot exist outside of the digital realm. And sometimes it's great, sometimes it's a little bit too much, but when it's great, mm -hmm. it is so, uh, such a challenge to the ears, something, uh, but it's not challenge as something difficult, it's just finally I hear something I've never heard before. And it can be very beautiful. What, what is the letters you're saying, S N D. S N D. Okay. I need to check. I've never seen that before. They've been around since the mid nineties. And the, the main guy in this, Mark Fell, he's being become like kind of a, a go-to guy for sound art and all that. And his son is making post club music that is amazing. Uh, that um, uh, 45 RPM Michael uh, uh, and I talked and uh, who is in my opinion, one of the, his son, Ryan Trinor, one of the few guys who's doing something that still is futuristic, still is like 
where is this coming from? Where the, the reference points are very difficult to grasp at first, but also very uh, rewarding because he managed to do what his dad does with electronica, but push it into the dance music territory. So in a much more hedonistic way. Check it out for sure. Amazing. My final showings are dedicated to Michael here. <laughs> yes. Now, 1980, Paul McCartney, uh, January, goes on tour with Wings. And right when they enter Japan, he gets busted. He's in jail for 10 days. Wings splits up. He had worked on some of this record before, but then during, in a way, his pandemic after, you could argue, he was fooling around at home with a studio, turned into McCartney too. The reason they called it that is because it's 10 years after his first solo album and it's only him doing everything. This is the McCartney album that people either love or it's their, or they hate it completely. It's synthesizer based. It's got a song Temporary Secretary, which actually years later became this sort of cult semi club thing. But this but the thing about this and this and um, Christian and I spoke about it briefly is the B side of this 12 inch, which is called Secret Friend, only available on a B side, a 10 minute uh, electronic uh, ongoing uh, I wouldn't say it's drone or, or ambient, but it's a repetitive piece of music and it's a beautiful piece of music. So, you know, Paul, Paul always wanted to have a little avant-garde side to himself and he kind of teases it, never fully goes uh, totally in on it. I know uh, there's two CDs that uh, Christian hates that Paul McCartney did with youth under the name Fireman, which are very ambient, um, electronic based moody records. This one's called uh, Russia's, the Fireman. It's called Russia's In. And if you, the name because Fireman Russia's In is a line from Penny Lane. And of course, um, if nothing else for our uh, fans out there, the artwork on the uh, CD, inner artwork was pretty controversial uh, for McCartney fans there. Nice. This is a, these were uh, records that he did alone. Oh, actually he, he did jointly with Youth who was the bass player of the post-punk band Killing Joke. And they did a series of them. The third one they did, Electronic Arguments is actually a song based. So that's not, that's the one that's not a uh, electronic based record. So uh, that's my closeout. Uh, you, just so Youth who also was a collaborator of The Orb. There we go, and yeah. So that and this is actually very influenced. Bringing it back to Michael, very influenced from Kraftwerk. You know, yeah. uh, he listened to a lot of Kraftwerk there. So there is a connection um, between Kraftwerk and uh, Paul McCartney, nineteen eighty. Uh, yeah, this is very. I mean, if you like radioactivity, this is very much in tune with that. In my opinion, it, it is a right. So that's, that's, my, that's my final electronic offer offering michael good, good beatles working um so on my picks i started from my youth and i'm ending now with uh, the most contemporary artist i have that i consider electronic based um this is the experimental artist jeffrey cantu ledesma um if you're not familiar with jeffrey he has a achieved a, a great amount of success in my in my opinion in this niche world of ambient experimental stuff he used to run a label uh called root strata which has put out a bunch of amazing records and a blog that that's how i used to find out about obscure music um this is all looped electric guitar and i believe it's a lin drum machine like an 80s analog drum um, machine that was recorded to tape um, jeffrey had his own label shining skull and now releases on mexican summer uh, very accessible, experimental, electronic, ambient style music. And he's collaborated with all sorts of people. Um, he's abs abs actually now a Zen Buddhist priest, as well as a musician from the Bay Area. He was in a band called Tarantel in the early days um, and now is making music under his own name and has recently moved to upstate New York. Uh, extremely prolific, beautiful human, beautiful artist. 
Um, all of his stuff is great. There's something for everyone. This was a repress of an uh, album that came out, I believe, in 2013. Um, but this is a great two long form pieces that are like looping guitar with uh, programmed electronic drums. Um, and right. most of his newer stuff is more uh, a, a bigger mix of acoustic and electronic instrumentation. This one's a little more simple. Very nice. Um, you mentioned the. Check out Jeffrey. Hmm. You mentioned the lean drum. That, that's a great connection yeah. also to more mainstream music because the lean drum is the electronic drum machine that is uh, one of the best uh, that, that has the most distinctive aesthetic to it. And uh, well, he this guy is the master of the lean drum as well. Okay. All of Prince yeah. early I stuff he uses uh, the lean drum. Mm. I hear he's pretty good. <laughs> okay yeah tarantel is a really good band like the early tarantel stuff um the band uh, he used to be in before uh, was a post-rock band that was i believe a little bit boring at first but they came into something very different and the last four releases were fantastic and and he really set himself in a, on the path that was uh uh, that you couldn't have expected from the the earliest uh, releases of his career, and now I fully uh, support uh, Michael's uh, recommendation on on his. This is really great stuff with a great crossover appeal. Yep, totally. Uh, you, your dog is uh, ready to go outside. I think. No, he's just looking because his <laughs> art enemy is in the other garden, and uh, he's looking uh... there, looking to him if he's out there. <laughs> If, if they see him, we will hear that, believe me. <laughs> okay, Mike. okay, last turn. Um, you know, every once in a while, there is a new artist, and, and this new artist gives you the feeling, okay, now we have the next level, the next step. We talked about Autaker. Some of us think that was a new level, and I agree. And new artists, where I think this is the next level, is this one. And this is Gabo Lazar. It's in in a way in, in the tradition of of Orteca, but but he goes out there. It, it's completely new structured music to me, and and you know I I'm not so big uh, in describing music in, in in not 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 mother tongue language, but try him out he is striking really striking not so hard to get into really great stuff Gabo Laza, I, what i have i fully is, agree with michael you know, just like the, uh, no i fully agree with you like ah, uh, i played my one of my latest video i played the the, the last track of uh, the a side on this mm -hmm. what was great uh, with um, Gabor lazar and who's buddy with uh, Ryan Trinor and Jesse Borno Alentier. Uh, they are mm -hmm. the three of them um, and a few others. You were saying that Otteker used to be the future. And I agree that uh, that's why I say that uh, up to 2005, because what happened in 2005, suddenly um, the punks, Otteker, Apex Twin and all that, uh, who started from Electro and went to experimental, there was like um, a historical loop that resolved. Suddenly they made the whole journey uh, back and forth uh, within avant-garde music. And there was nothing really new to tell. What happened is that suddenly where was there anything left to discover within dance music, the mm -hmm. electronic dance mm -hmm. music. And that's what these guys are doing. Um, Gabor Lazar, he takes this uh, avant-garde electronics, uh, uh, very digital but aesthetic, by the way, also very hard sounds, and he inserts them in some of the most popular uh, electronic dance music, uh, hedonistic like Chicago House, uh, Footwork, Juke, and he makes it, uh, it like it's the first time you hear it in a club. It it feels challenging. Uh, but then you hear there's a real groove to it that really talks to the body before it talks to the mind or the heart. It is body music with great no, harmonies. What's great, Santi, 
you you are able to explain me why I like this music, and that's great. <laughs> that's a very interesting point to say it's body music. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, I might just feel mm -hmm. that. It, it is like uh, now we only have the. I'll cheat and I'll do quickly. I have the few things I wanted to to talk quickly, and uh, one thing that we talked before on um, in the. Uh, with Michael uh, in the in the background, um, how all this music that uh, that often is being called uh, electronic music, the club music, uh, house, techno, etc. If you're really brutally honest about it, this is not electronic music in the pure sense. Um, if you, for example, if like if you look at uh, one of the the most classic keyboards of electronic music, as we uh, popularly uh, know it. Um, the SH-101 from Roland, uh, an early 80s uh, keyboard, which has been used in just about any, every pop song in the in the 80s and 90s that were using uh, keyboards. If you look at the manual of it, there's four pages of how does it work. And then there's 76 pages of uh, setups to make the keyboard sounds like an instrument, like a flute, a trumpet, uh, 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 viola. So basically, they make this uh, machine uh, philosophically totally against what is electronic music, mm -hmm. escaping uh, familiarity, mm -hmm. escaping tonality. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, mm -hmm. as also Mazzy was uh, saying earlier, how this when the synthesizer got smaller, which meant also less synthesis in it, less oscillators. Um, so, and more um, uh, how would you put it? Uh, um, functional, more functional, uh, like the one of the greatest uh, pieces of um, of in electronic instruments for house music, the TB three hundred three, which is a bass synthesizer. The the whole acid from Acid House. This is, comes from this. This is a bass synthesizer for people who didn't have a, a bass player. So it's basically a, originally a cheap cop out uh, that just because of sheer inventivity and and um, and necessity got yeah. retooled to, into something more interesting, which also back to minorities and back black culture, when disco got totally obliterated by the neocons in the late 70s, they didn't want to have anything, the, the disco, like the, this welcoming music, where like black people, Latino, old people, gay people, everyone was welcome in the club for disco. Of course, the neocons, they would, <laughs> that, that was not the greatest thing. You have to divide people. And uh, so they they paid the radios so that disco would, wouldn't exist. There was this movement, Disco Sucks, uh, where they literally made people burn and destroy their disco records. So suddenly, kids in the early 80s wanted to do disco. There was no economy for it. You couldn't like put together a band because you would never get played, you would never get a record deal. So they bought these cheap synthesizers to make a disco band. And in the process, they didn't do disco, they did something else. They invented house music, they invented techno. So this music is the music of necessity and also of economic um, um, violence in a way. Um, and, and that's why this music also is very physical uh, to get back to the point, uh, uh, and, body music. And these and these uh, in, these inventions of uh, synthesizers and processors and programmers and computers put a lot of musicians out of work, unfortunately, too. And uh, they had to kind of reinvent themselves. You didn't need, you know, a whole string section, for instance, on your records. Maybe, but and I don't think it lasted that long. On the other hand, it got a lot of people into music because it was easier. Oh, absolutely. To, to I mean, they're, they're, yeah. I mean, look at, I mean, studios, we know about recording studios too. Look at, so. So, so I, I wanted just to show a few quickly, a few records. First, uh, one for Michael. Uh, 45 yeah, Eric. Yeah, yeah, the to audio, file. Michael. audio file, Michael. <laughs> Uh, this record, by... Too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Um, Shell Samkov, um, Norwegian composer. This is percussion uh, music, modern classical, 
with electronic treatment. This is from uh, 83, I believe. And I wanted to show this because um, in my opinion, this is the best sounding record in my whole collection. Um, wow. This is an audiophile record in my opinion that no one knows about because uh, audiophile people usually aren't really um, into like music that is not like, this is a nobody. This guy hasn't done anything that no one would have really noticed apart from a little bit in Europe in the eighties in modern classical. And for some reason, the pressing of this, which means the, the cutting, the, the mixing uh, is spell binding, even for someone who has a very basic sound system. Uh, I'll say that now with also the uh, new knowledge, um, um, most of you guys know I press records for a living. I, I own a record plant. And uh, so the concern of what actually is a good pressing and how you achieve that and what is the myth and what is reality of what you can do I have quite extensive knowledge and I think that we might be talking about that some other time. But this record, Shiel Kiel Gjel Samkopf, um, Music for Solo Percussion and Electronics, is one of the best sounding records I've heard in my whole life. And I've heard millions of records, <laughs> a little <laughs> hyperbole. <Wow. but laughs> and something for Mazzy, um, this is, William Bazinski's music for shortwaves on the raster nothing from 98. Uh, William Bazinski is someone that I think uh, my, uh, both Michaels love and um, obsessed. Yeah. And this is as Mezzi has been into the caretaker. Uh, there's a um, the caretaker obviously yeah he is the, his music would i don't know if it would exist the same way without uh, william bazinski but this one is a record of his that is less talked about usually i think when i told michael uh, about it he didn't even know it existed um it, it's maybe his earliest uh, lp and it is more electronic than uh, tape based so which is a little bit different than what you usually know about uh, from him this is more proper electronics and you know that this album michael have you heard of this i album? don't know that one no and i thought i i thought but i knew yeah, very much into about him. Him. Yeah. Is, it is from 1998 yes, yeah okay. yeah I, I think i have most of his early stuff on on cd but i've, I've never seen that one hmm. Yeah, Great. it's in the same series, uh, you know, um, when Avanoto did, did this um, collaboration with Ryochi Sakamoto, the, yeah. he did three LPs. This is the same series, but this, I think, believe this is the first one. This is the, the, seven, uh, the seventh release on, uh, on Noton, uh, Alvanoto's uh, label. So it's quite early in his career. And then there, there's, as I'm French, I, I had to mention a little bit of French music. And as we all are into jazz, uh, probably one of the greatest and most famous jazz players from France, Michel Portal, who's a, a clarinet saxophone player and who's famous for being one of the greatest improvisers. Like all his records are uh, live. He doesn't do uh, his studio recordings. Okay. Apart from the one time he did um, studio, uh, um, yeah, one studio recording solo uh, where he plays everything and overdubs it. Uh, and there's this track on this called um, African Ritual, uh, where he plays the, um, the bass clarinet and shouts in it so hard that it starts sounding like a didgeridoo. And okay. he, he just loops everything in the most creative way possible uh, at, at the time. This is from uh, 79. And this is a record that is still very underrated because it's very different from what he's famous for but this is probably more appealing for most people than his regular stuff and also more price wise appealing because you can still find it for quite cheap okay. and wow. on the on the um, my real electronic music hero bernard parmigiani we, whom I got every, every single record he did. And these uh, beautiful Philips silver 
cover records. Uh, I want you guys to indulge me. I know this has been reissued recently. <laughs> <laughs> there is this a record of his on the INA GRM uh, label, which is the French National Archive, um, which is basically uh, a loop back to the beginning as it, this is um, the, the club that was started by Pierre Schaffer, the Musique Concrète guy, this is Musique Concrète. And there's this track on this. This album is called Dehors, Dehors, Inside, Outside. And there's a track called Pour en finir avec le pouvoir d'Orphée, To end it all with Orpheus power. This is the most powerful music I've heard in my whole life. This is pure electronic music. Damn. But it's, it is, it's a linear story being told with all the means available from um, electronic music, tape music, um, digital synthesis, uh, old school oscillators with lamps, um, harmonizers. And this is, this is some of the most intense music I've ever heard as sometimes it's just like bursts of power, energy of sound. And sometimes it becomes very melodic, very almost um, symphonic in a way. And this is uh, absolutely stun stunning music that like, if you want to, to touch at what uh, some of the ultimate potential of what electronic music allows, this is it. Bernard Parmigiani, De En Dehors. But this is the original that the reissue on Mego is available, I believe, and with another mm -hmm. cover. And lastly, I wouldn't be stunty if I didn't show you. <laughs> Uh, a record with some <laughs> cartoon sex. Of course. <laughs> Cover your children's eyes. Yeah. So this is Experimental Audio Research here. The band from um, Sonic Boom from the Spaceman Free that he did with Kevin uh, Shields from uh, My Bloody Valentine, Kevin Martin from The Bug God, and Eddie Prevost from uh, AMM. And this is when I discovered this in 1996, I wasn't ready for this because this, this is pure okay. drone, electronic okay. uh, music made from vintage synthesizers. And- um, It doesn't look drone that cover, not at all. No, but this is, uh, by the way, this is Anthony Osgong who did the cover, the, the guy who does all these mm -hmm. covers for MGMT and all these bands. And, okay. and uh, this is stunning, uh, stark, Bro uh, dark brooding drones and pure electronic sounds um, in, a, um, in a very ambient atmospheric and almost utilitarian oh, uh, uh, in a way that is uh, uh, in, the, in the Brian in a way you, know, uh, you could say but there is something a little weird about it and what's interesting with this is that this guy um, Sonic Boom in this, he references La Monte Young, Delia Derbyshire, and many other pioneers a good 10, 15 years before uh, mainstream uh, underground culture, like the Wire magazine and all this starts to address uh, uh, these guys, mm -hmm. which kind of tells you how before his time, even with um, the Spaceman Free, this guy was. And yeah. <laughs> wow. So. That's it for part one. Nine <laughs> parts. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, Dr. Stanti, for the, for the deep lesson. It's great. Yeah, that's what I call passion, Stanti. Electronic. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's passion when I feel like almost uh, frustrated by all the stuff that we didn't talk about. Uh, but it's great. You have to start somewhere. We want to introduce people to it. I mean, yeah. I mean, I learned a lot yeah. today. I think we all learned something because. Uh, yeah. And, and I hope really that uh, that uh, our audience realized that uh, there was very little indulgence in this. Like most of the stuff that we talked is actually really worth seeking out um, and testing for yourself. Um, we talked about mostly music that I think has something to offer to just about anyone, even <laughs> even if uh, if you feel you have prejudice against electronic music. I, I just hope really that oh, people no. understand that uh, that some of the main lessons we should have uh, from this discussion, I learned stuff like just by interacting with you um, rhetorically, 
that like electronic music is just music and it has as much if not more diversity than than you would expect from traditional pop music because pop music is part of electronic music as well yeah of course. Could, and rock even rock music has <laughs> thank you thanks guys hang thank on you there. thank you very much